Thank you so much, Pastor. Let me invite you to open your Bible tonight to the book of Daniel, chapter number 7. The book of Daniel, chapter number 7. And I'd like to begin reading from Daniel 7 and verse number 9. Daniel 7 and verse 9. And, and as you're turning there, I, I'd just like to take a moment, if I might, tonight and say thank you so much to Brother Wandell. Thank you so much to Catches Point Baptist Church. And, my wife and I so much appreciate your graciousness and uh, your preacher's hospitality. And we just enjoyed these days. And I, I, I'm so grateful and so thankful to see what the Lord is doing, how God's brought your pastor here. And, and uh, we're just confident there's some great days ahead as you stay faithful to the Word of God and to the work of God. I'm Amen. excited for you. I, I appreciate Brother Wandell's heart for the Word of God. I appreciate his heart for you and, and his heart for the ministry. And I'm just excited that uh, he's here and thankful for him. You know, when it comes to our valley, this great, great city of Phoenix and all the, the little towns, they're not really little towns, but uh, make up the whole Metroplex area, why, you know, there's an answer. And the answer is see people saved, Amen. see them baptized into a local church Amen. where they're taught not just part of the Bible, they're taught the whole counsel of God so that churches go out and start churches. Amen. And uh, we're part of that right now on the north side of Phoenix, a, a, a local church planted a local church. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to the day when your pastor will be used to the Lord at Cactus Point Baptist Church will reproduce itself. And, Amen. and there's no big problem in our valley that, uh, that the Lord doesn't have a solution for. And that's to see people say, baptized into a church, taught the word of God, and churches starting churches. And I know it's your pastor's burden. And it's his passion, and I'm excited for you, and uh, looking forward to see what great things God is going to do as uh, you just keep going forward for him. Let me just encourage you. I love the story in the Old Testament. Remember where Moses' <coughs> arms began to sag, and, and uh, God said, Moses, you hold that rod up, and I'll give you the battle. And, of course, humanly speaking, there's only so long a man could do that. And, and when Moses was weary and tired, uh, that's when God raised up some men that stood with Moses, and and they pretty much propped his arms up. Remember the story. And God won the great victory. And isn't a great picture on what we need to do for our pastors? And, and, and you get weary in well-doing. Well, your pastor does too. Everybody does. And yet that's when it's a blessed thing to see people rally with their preacher and, and so to speak, prop his arms up and say, we're just going to stand with you. Just keep doing right, preaching right, going right. And, and uh, when a local church bands together and attempts mighty things for God, then there are great things that can happen. And I, I, I just encourage you to join your pastor and say, let's step out by faith and, and let's just trust God for the southern part of Phoenix. I mean, wow, Amen. what a wide open area this is. And, how, how critical it is just to see churches just like yours established all around the valley. So God bless you. Keep going forward for him. Stay faithful to the work. And, and uh, we're just confident the Lord who has begun a good work is going to continue to do that work. God bless you. Thank you for being so gracious to us. You have your Bible tonight to the book of Daniel, chapter number 7. I'd like to begin in verse number 9. You know, when you come to Daniel... If there's a danger, and I don't know if that's the right word or not, but, but if there's a risk, well, sometimes we can miss the forest for the trees. And what I mean by that is you read the book of Daniel, there's so many great stories. I, I mean, so many of them just stand uh, alone. It's just what an incredible part of the Bible this is. But, you know, it's awfully easy to miss the big picture. But in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 9, the Bible tells us what that big picture is. So if you're able tonight, could I invite you to stand together with me as we look to the word of God in Daniel 7, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. My Father, we ask for your help tonight as we open the Bible, and I pray that our ears and our hearts and our minds would be centered on thus saith the Lord. I pray if there's someone here tonight who has never been saved, what a great night to call upon the name of the Lord. Then I pray for your people, Lord, and in the midst of a busy world, in the midst of a world that has abandoned the Word of God and the God of the Word, I pray that tonight we would check our own hearts, our own priorities. So we ask for your help now in the great name of Jesus we come. Amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. No matter where you go in the book of Daniel, there's a theme that keeps rising from the pages of the Word of God. I mean, for all the powerful stories and all the great stories, there's still one theme that always rises right to the top. 
Of course, it all begins in Daniel chapter 1 with the Babylonians invading the great city of Jerusalem. Daniel would be led away captive with some others, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, uh, uh, to name a few. Uh, they would be carried away from the city of Jerusalem as young teenagers. And, and uh, why little did they know, or maybe they could guess, but they would never, never return to that city again. There were three times the Babylonians attacked the city of Jerusalem. Each time, at least on the first of two occasions, they, they put in a king who they thought would listen to Babylon, but give it enough time and the king would rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. And, and finally it was three strikes and you're out. And the city of Jerusalem was raised. For the rest of his life, Daniel and his buddies would be in a distant city. It was certainly an incredibly difficult life. You can imagine them being led away as captives, imagining, you know, what dark things are they going to do to us? What horrific things and plans do they have for us as slaves in a distant land? And yet that was the thing. Because they didn't beat them and they didn't horrifically do things to them. Instead, the Bible tells us they put him in the king's palace. They went to the University of Babylon and they were granted a scholarship to learn the ways of Babylon. Why, the Bible tells us they were invited to dine at the king's table and eat the food and the wine which he drank. And, and yet that's where Daniel drew the line. I mean, they came and said, Daniel, we're going to change your name and name you after a pagan. And, you know, Daniel didn't get worked up over that. He knew his real name. They came to Daniel and said, now and now we're going to enroll you in a pagan university where you're going to be taught the false religions of Babylon. And, you know, that didn't affect him either, it seems, because Daniel was well-grounded. Hey, we'd be well-grounded if we had preachers like, oh, I don't know, Ezekiel and, and uh, oh, preachers like Jeremiah and preachers like Zephaniah preaching revival meetings week after week. And that wasn't the thing that stirred him. But the amazing thing is that when the king said, you're going to eat my food, you're going to eat the baby back ribs, and, and you're going to eat the fried shrimp, and you're going to drink the booze, my, you're going to drink from my wine cup, that's where Daniel drew the line. And you know, I believe there's a reason for that. Because there's no verse in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not let the pagans change your name. There was no verse in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not enroll in the pagan university of Babylon. But you know, for a Jewish person, there was plenty of Bible verses that says you don't eat that food and you don't drink that wine. So that's where Daniel drew the line. He followed the word of God. What a story it is. And by the time you come to the end of Daniel chapter 1, even Nebuchadnezzar had to admit it. Everybody in the palace of Babylon had to say that Daniel and his buddies were more excellent. What a testimony in Daniel chapter 1. Of course, in Daniel chapter 2, the Bible tells us Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. In that dream, God literally tells him what the next six centuries of world history are going to be. It is one of the most astounding moments, uh, not just in Bible, but in world history. I, I mean, it is so powerful that the liberal seminary professors say, obviously, Daniel did not write Daniel. Because nobody 600 years ahead of time could say the next empire is going to be the Persian Empire, followed by Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire, followed by the Roman Empire. They say nobody could do that, so obviously somebody wrote the book of Daniel 600 years later and put his name on it. You know, it's a whole lot easier to say, let God be true and every liberal cemetery Amen. professor a liar. The word of God is so. And the dream comes to Nebuchadnezzar. You've been there. You have a dream and you kind of wake up and, and, and you know there was a dream and you know it was kind of powerful, but you can't remember. And so Nebuchadnezzar calls for all the liberal ministers from the National Council of Church or whatever they called it in. He lines them up and said, I had a dream. So number one, I want you to tell me the dream. Number two, tell me the interpretation. And if you don't, you're dead men. And of course, those liberal seminary professors and theologians could say, nobody can do what you're asking. You just tell us the dream and we'll give you a whopper of an interpretation. I think they were good at that. And that's when Nebuchadnezzar said, I knew it. You're a bunch of phonies and frauds. Off with your heads. And it was pretty much the song, they're coming to take me away. When Daniel said, what happened? And he hears the story and Daniel says, tell King Nebuchadnezzar, I can't interpret the dream, and I don't know what the dream is, but I know somebody who does know. 
And the next thing you know, Daniel's standing before Nebuchadnezzar, the mightiest emperor in the world. And that teenager is telling Nebuchadnezzar what the next 600 years of world history are going to be like. What an astounding moment in world history. Of course, in Daniel chapter 3, the three boys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Hey, could we please get the names right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were names the Babylonians gave them. We don't call Daniel Belteshazzar, so we shouldn't call these other guys by their pagan Babylonian names, each one of which honors some pagan idol and deity in Babylon. No, their names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And, and you know the story, the king built an altar to his an image to his religion, a graven image almost 100 feet high. And he said, when the praise band begins to play, you're all going to fall down on your knees and worship my idol and my religion. And three boys stood up straight and tall. They didn't need another chance. The next thing you know, they're being tossed into a burning, fiery furnace with the blatant words of the king saying, who will deliver you out of my hand? And Daniel chapter 3 has the answer to that, doesn't it? And good old Nebuchadnezzar pretty soon is looking in the fire. He doesn't see three men. He sees four men. Uh, four men. And then he said the fourth is like the Son of God. Amen. Better make sure you have the right Bible there. You know, modern Bibles get, and the liberal seminary professors say, oh, no, no, no. How could Nebuchadnezzar know what the Son of God looked like? So they changed what the Bible says. They changed it to a son of the gods. Seriously, modern Bibles, that's what it says. And, and I have a question for the liberal seminary professors. Excuse me. How would Nebuchadnezzar know what a son of the gods looks like? There's no such thing. And, and they come along and say, well, how would he know what Jesus looks like, the son of God? And there's a real simple answer to that. Because as you read Daniel 1 through 4, you see that Daniel had a tremendous love for Nebuchadnezzar, a tremendous burden for Nebuchadnezzar. You discover in Daniel chapter 12 that Daniel spent his life, we call it a soul winner. He spent his life turning people to righteousness. I think the biggest guy in his heart, the number one prayer target was Nebuchadnezzar. I'm certain he got saved at the end of Daniel chapter number 4. The reason he knew who the Son of God was was because Daniel had explained it to him. No doubt about it. That's why the Bible says he could recognize the Son of God. Amen. There is no such thing as a son of the gods. That's right. What a story in Daniel 3. Of course, in Daniel chapter number 4, Nebuchadnezzar in his pride and his arrogance says, look at this great, great work that I have built. And that's when the God of the Bible strikes him with insanity. For seven years, the Bible tells us that he wanders the wilderness. And the purpose was this, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And you know, with that statement, we have the theme of the book of Daniel. Because be it some young boys taken away captive out of Jerusalem, be it the story of the mightiest king in, in world in the day, Nebuchadnezzar, the great emperor. I be it the story of a burning, fiery furnace, or a king who exalts himself and says, how great I am. Rising out of the pages of the book of Daniel, it's there again and again and again that you would know the Most High God ruleth over the affairs of men. God is bigger than an emperor in a war against Jerusalem. Amen. God is bigger than the dreams that no one can interpret. God is bigger than a burning fiery furnace. God is bigger than the greatest ruler in the world. Amen. How about in Daniel chapter number 5? Probably the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Some debate about that. But the Bible tells us he was now the ruler in Babylon. His name was Belshazzar. What a wicked, evil man he was. And one day he finally crossed the line. He said, get the temples, uh, the, 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 the vessels that we took out of the temple of Jerusalem. He filled them with liquor and began to taunt the God of Israel. And the next thing you know, there was the hand of God writing on the wall. Many, many, tekel ufarsim, the language of the common day. God gave him a message you couldn't help but understand. He said, God, he said, Belshazzar, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Judgment is coming. And before the sun rose the next morning, Belshazzar was a dead man. And the Persians had taken over Babylon and the empire. And one more time, we are reminded that it doesn't matter if your name is Nebuchadnezzar. It doesn't matter if your name is Belshazzar. For that matter, it doesn't matter if your name is the King Cyrus of Persia. It doesn't matter if you're Alexander the Great. It doesn't matter if you're one of the great emperors of Rome, Nero himself. When it is all said and done, the book of Daniel is in the Bible so you and I would understand 
that the Most High God ruleth over the affairs of men. It is God who establishes kings and kingdoms. It is God that ruleth in the kingdom of men. Of course, in Daniel chapter 6, there's Daniel being tossed into that den of lions. And now we discover yet one more time that God is bigger than a burning fiery furnace. And God is bigger than a den of raging lions. And God is bigger than it all. And be it his creation, his animal kingdom. Be it his creation in fire. I be it the rulers and the emperors. The thing that keeps rising out of the book of Daniel is that no matter who the king is, no matter where the empire's found, no matter how big the army may be, no matter how great the rulers are, when it is all said and done, it is the most high God, the God of the Bible, Amen. that ruleth over the affairs of men. In other words, if there's one thing that keeps jumping out of the book of Daniel, when you miss the trees and get the forest now, is that it doesn't matter if your name is Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, it doesn't matter if it's a burning fiery furnace or a den of lions. When it is all said and done, God is still on the throne. Amen. Years ago in the country of Canada, it was a cold winter night. And again, I think every night's a cold winter night in Canada. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but a train was stuck in the snow, and there was some great fear that the passengers might, might literally freeze to death. And one brave man got out of that, got out of the train, and he went to see if he could find some help. And sure enough, he went over a hill and another hill, and he could see in the distance a house, a little house with a light on. Well, the next thing you know, the passengers on that train were safe and sound inside that house. The house happened to be owned by a young preacher named Frank Suffield. He was just starting in evangelism and traveling Canada and, and preaching the Word of God. And, and that night, of course, Mr. Suffield opened up his house and he warmed those people by the fire, gave them what he could to eat. And uh, those passengers, when they could finally go on the trek, they were so thankful for the hospitality of that man. Perhaps he saved their lives. Well, one of the ladies who happened to be on that train, who happened to go to the house that night, was a young music student. Her name was Kitty Jennett. Just in gratitude, she wrote a little note of thanks to that single preacher, and that note of thanks turned into uh, uh, letters that went back and forth, and it turned into two people who fell in love and finally were married. And Kitty and Frank Suffield would spend their lives traveling Canada, then in the United States, preaching the word of God, preaching the blood of Christ. One day, their meetings took them to the church where Frank Suffield grew up in Canada. His pastor was a pastor named Pastor Shea. And when Frank Suffield was preaching during that meeting, the teenage son of Pastor Shea was saved. You've heard his name, George Beverly Shea. I, the Lord used them, the Lord used them in many ways to preach the word, to do great works. And, and one day, Kitty Jeanette, maybe thinking back to that day when she first met the man who would become her husband, maybe looking back over a life of serving God and realizing, well, no matter how many trials and burdens may come, no matter how many potential disasters may sit on the horizon, it is a God, the God of the Bible, who rises out of all those stories and it is the God of the Bible who still rules over the affairs of men. Mm -hmm. And it was Kitty Janet Suffield who wrote one of my favorite songs. It goes like this. Have you started for glory in heaven? Have you left this old world far behind? And your heart is the comforter dwelling. Can you say, praise the Lord, he is mine. Have the ones that once walked down the highway come back and gone back and you seem all alone. Well, keep your eye on the prize. It's your home in the skies. God is still on the throne. Amen. You may live in a den or a cottage <laughs> unnoticed by those who pass by, but a mansion for you he is building in that beautiful city on high. It will outshine the wealth and the splendor of the richest on earth we have known. He's the architect true and he's building for you. God is still on the throne. He is coming again as the promise to his disciples when he went away. In like manner as he has gone from you, you will see him returning one day. Does his tarrying cause you to wonder? Does it seem he's forgotten his own? But his promise is true and he's coming for you. God is still on the throne. The chorus says God is still on the throne and he will remember his own. Though trials may press us and burdens distress us, he never will leave us alone. God is still on the throne. He never abandons his own. His promise is true. He will not forget you, for God is still on the throne. Amen. It, my friend, is the story of the book of Daniel. Because be it Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, King Cyrus, 
Darius the king, be it Alexander the Great, be it Nero or another great emperor of Rome, I be it some emperor dictator, be it President Trump, be it the leader of China, be it the prime minister of England, none of those things matter when it is all said and done. Because the Bible tells us that when the dust settles, Almighty God is the one sitting upon the throne. He is the one that rules over the affairs of men. He is the one that raises kingdoms and removes kingdoms. Because the book of Daniel is in the Bible to remind us. Call it the Babylonian Empire. Call it the Medo-Persian Empire. Call it the Grecian Empire. Call it the Roman Empire. Or ultimately in Daniel, call it the Empire of the Antichrist. But when it is all said and done, every one of those emperors discover that God is still on the throne. What a chapter is Daniel, chapter number 7. We come to verse number 9, and the Bible tells us that earlier in Daniel 7, we realize Daniel is in the midst of a vision now. In the midst of the vision, he said, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. Those thrones are referring to human governments. There is going to come a day when every last government will be cast down. From the United States of America, pick your kingdom, pick your democracy, pick your dictator, and every last one of the thrones of this world are going to be cast down. But notice when human governments, when all the capitals are cast down, who is sitting? And the Bible tells us the Ancient of Days did sit. The Ancient of Days is one great name for God the Father, and what a name it is. Could I please stop, because I'm afraid people have gotten the Hollywood concept here, and they've got it all wrong. Because the Hollywood idea is that God is this grandfather type guy, you know, maybe a Santa Claus guy. That he's got this big long white beard and, and he just wakes up from his nap or gets back from his golf game to pat somebody else on the head. And, and that is the, the image, that's the caricature that Hollywood has given people about God. Not so. The Bible doesn't say he is an old man, it says he is the ancient of days. They are two very different things. Ancient of days would be a term Israelites would use to talk about the grandest of the grand. The Bible does not say that God is old. He is the ancient of days. It tells us that he is eternal. The God of the Bible always was. The God of the Bible is. And the God of the Bible always shall be. And no matter where you find yourself, he is always in the present tense. And when the Bible calls him the ancient of days, from eternity past to eternity in the future, the Bible tells us it is God Almighty who rules and reigns. Amen. Notice the Word of God tells us the ancient of days did sit. I love that. You know, probably the text is referring to because a little later we get into the, the Antichrist and the prophecies and, and a lot of this may well be settling and dealing with the time we call the tribulation. And if there's one thing we know about the tribulation, it is certainly well named, isn't it? I mean, it's when the wheels literally come off. I mean, it's when the mountains are leveled, the islands are not found. It is going to be a time when this earth is judged by Almighty God. There will be fire. There will be cataclysmic judgments. I mean, the world is literally going to be shaken to the core. Half of its population is going to be slain. And yet through it all, do you see what the Bible tells us God does? The Ancient of Days did say that's our father. He's never going to get into a panic. He's never going to get stirred up. The picture is almighty God just calmly sitting on his throne. The word of God tells us his garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. The absolute purity of our God. The word of God shows his great power. It says his throne was like a fiery flame. His wheels as a burning fire. Thrones in the Old Testament often would be portable. They put wheels on them. But with God's throne, it's a fiery throne. The fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. We are reminded of the judgment of God. By the word of God tells us that he judges with fire. Not just an eternity in the lake of fire and brimstone. But it is that fire that trieth the hearts of men. There is no one that can escape his eye. There is no one that can escape his presence. There is no one that can find anywhere to hide. But that almighty God does not see them. Amen. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Ten thousand times, ten, a, a, a thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times, ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the book is open. Almighty God has just sat down to judge the nations. For all the panic and all the humans that have attacked him and sworn in him. For all of the humans that have shaken a fist at him and blasphemed and cursed his name. 
Conley, the Ancient of Days, sits upon the throne of judgment. It is judgment day. And the Bible tells us that 10,000 times 10,000 are going to stand before him. I read that in ancient Babylon, 10,000 was their largest number. So for the people of Babylon's day to say 10,000 times 10,000, and understand that would be in our in effect saying to us infinity times infinity. They are going to stand before the great God of the Bible. And if there's one thing we ought to get from Daniel 7, 9, and 10 is that judgment day is coming. But it is God who determines when judgment day comes. Amen. My friend, it is God that ruleth over the kingdoms of the world. It is God that establishes an emperor and puts another one down. For all the power that humans take to themselves. For all the hubris and pride that world leaders have adopted for themselves. The God of the Bible can only laugh and hold the nation <coughs> because it is God that says when judgment day comes. Amen. It is God who sits down upon the throne and it is God who judges the secrets of men. Amen. God is still on the throne. It's the story of the book of Daniel. Doesn't matter if it's the Babylonians. Doesn't matter if it's the Persians. Doesn't matter if it's Alexander the Great. For all of his arrogance and all of his pride. It doesn't matter if it's somebody like a Nero. It doesn't matter if it's an Adolf Hitler. It doesn't matter if it's a Putin. It doesn't matter if it's a Pol Pot. It doesn't matter if it's a Fidel Castro. It doesn't matter if it's a President of the United States. It doesn't matter if it's the Prime Minister. It doesn't matter if it's some Saudi king. It doesn't matter what a human has been elected or perhaps promoted themselves. When it is all said and done, every last kingdom of this world will be put down and Almighty God is sitting on the throne. Amen. That's what happens when the dust settles. And you know, you read Daniel 7, 9, and 10, and i got to tell you, it's powerful, isn't it? Because you remember when the Lord Jesus met Satan and, and Satan tempted him. And of course first he said, command these stones be made bread. And, and it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And, and then remember that they went to the pinnacle of the temple and, and he misquoted the Bible. Satan did, of course. He, he just misquoted Psalm 91. He's real good at that, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And of course the Lord corrected him. And the next thing you know, they're on a mountaintop. And the Bible says, not Matthew, but in the Luke account, that in a moment of time, they went to the kingdoms of the world, the governments of the world. And who knows what time frame, past, present, could have been future in our day. And they saw the kingdoms of the world. And, and then it's one of the most incredible statements in the Bible, where the Word of God tells us that Satan said to the Lord Jesus, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you the kingdoms now. It's like Satan saying, I know one day you will be king. We're going to take a shortcut here. And before you go to Calvary, Isaiah 53, I'll make you the king of the world now. I'll make you the king of the governments now. Remember what he said. The Bible tells us the kingdoms of the world had been delivered to Satan. And the amazing thing is Jesus didn't correct them. Did you ever stop and wonder? And you can look at our kingdom, we call it a government. But it just doesn't have to be America. You can pick any, any country you want. Did you ever just shake your head? And you probably do. And when you watch the news and say, how can these people do this? How can people run for office and say one thing and go to Washington and do something entirely different? How could it be after thousands of years of world history that you bring it to the United States and the people in 33 out of 34 states say a marriage is one man and one woman and then unilaterally one president says we're going to change world history and, and we're going to redefine what marriage is. I mean, how do they do this? And how is it that through the ages, I mean, in the last 100 years, you know and I know, there are, 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 are philosophical differences, to use the term, or governmental differences between a, a Hitler and a Pol Pot and a Mao Zedong and a Fidel Castro and a, and a Putin and a Stalin. You know, they, they had some differences, but you know, there was one thing they all did. They all attacked Christianity, and they could never allow Bibles in their country. They did their best to rid them. How does that work? How is it we look at our country, and, and, and there's such a disconnect? And in houses of politic, and it doesn't have to be Washington, it could be Washington Street. How is it that government leaders, it just seems like they're so passionate. If there's only one book they want to get rid of, that's the Bible. There's only one name they won't allow in public discourse, the name of Jesus. Yeah. I mean, they can't have a, a setting at Christmas. Everything they can to eliminate him, they hate him. It's not like they say, well, we're not religious, you are, let's leave it at that. They say, oh, no, no, we are not, and you cannot be either, and you cannot allow it in the public place. How is that possible? And, and you know, sometimes you shake your heads at these people. If we met them tomorrow at Starbucks, they'd be fine. 
And then all of a sudden they get to some place, a, a power in Washington Street or Washington, D.C., and why do they behave so wickedly? You know why? Because the Bible says Satan does his work in the governments of the world. That's what had been delivered unto him. That's where he gets access. You know, we, we sometimes say, oh, the devil's really giving me a hard time. Probably not. Uh, I'm just, probably not, because, you know, the, the Satan, he's not like God. God's everywhere, but Satan is not. Right. Satan's in one place at one time. And somebody here today, you know, one of us may be so important that Satan's really bothering us. Now, he's got plenty of demons and forces to do that. But, you know, he's probably a little more interested in that nutcase in North Korea, you know. Or they probably got some more people he's working on in Washington or London or who knows where. I, I'm pretty certain that, you know, we're not that high on the priority list. And, and he can only be in one place in one time. And, and the place where the Bible says he gets his work done is human government. And that's why one day the Bible tells us the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. It's all about that in Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 where the thrones, the kingdoms of this world are going to be demolished. Every last one of them is going to be destroyed. And when it is all said and done, no matter how vicious the dictator, no matter how evil the tyrant, no matter the Hitler, no matter the Stalin, no matter the Xi, uh, Xi and it's very, very serious, the persecution in China tonight. But it doesn't matter who they are. When the dust settles, just as it was in Daniel 2, Daniel 3, Daniel 4, Daniel 5, Daniel 6, the Bible tells us when the dust settles, God is still on the throne. Amen. Amen. What a God we serve. Amen. You know, you read Daniel 7, 9, and 10, and you kind of start shaking your head, preaching, you say, man, just can't get better than that. Oh, yeah, it can. Look at Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Well, we know who that is, don't we? 84 times in the Gospels, 84 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's called the Son of Man. It is the human name for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us, I beheld one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven. Well, of course he did. And that's why that prophecy in Acts chapter 1 is so powerful. Hey, watch the cloud come and take him out of the sight. And every word matters. The same way Jesus went back to heaven in so manner, such manner he'll come again. That's why in Revelation the Bible says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. One day the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. In Daniel 7, verse number 13, we have reached the climax of human history. We have reached that one moment in time where the first preacher we know about in world history preached of this. You know the first preacher in world history? His name was Enoch. And not only was Enoch the first known preacher, there had to be some before him, but he's the first one we know about, and we even know what he preached. In the book of Jude, Enoch started preaching, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly of all their ungodly speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Why, the first preacher we know of in the Bible preached that one day King Jesus was coming to the earth. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. The list is far too long even to give it to you tonight. I mean, verse after verse after verse describes this event right now where the Son of Man is coming with the clouds of heaven. It is the day when the kingdoms of the world are going to be given to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the day when every last human government is nothing but dust and ashes. And now the great God of heaven, the Ancient of Days, is going to give the kingdoms of the world to the Lord Jesus Christ. What a moment that is. Amen. The Bible says in Hebrews 2 and 9, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. It's that moment in time that Enoch preached about. It's that moment in time that righteous people have longed for. It's that moment in time that saved Hebrew people have wanted. That moment in time when at last King Jesus has come to sit upon the throne and the Bible says in verse number 14, there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. The Bible tells us coming all the way from heaven on a white horse is the Lord Jesus Christ. The armies of the world will try to have one last battle against him. That is a battle that is over before it even starts. 
The blood of the unsaved will flow through Armageddon to the valleys of Israel. And the word of God tells us in Zechariah that King Jesus is coming back to this world. The word of God tells us he's coming back to the Mount of Olives. If you've ever been to that part of the world, what a special spot it is. You stand on the Mount of Olives and you can look in the eastern gate. And when King Jesus returns, his, his foot is going to hit the Mount of Olives. That mountain splits right down the middle. Streams of living water flow in two directions. And King Jesus is going to enter through the eastern gate. He's going to sit upon the throne. And in Zechariah 14, 9, it says, The Lord shall reign over all the earth. And that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. If you could go to the Mount of Olives tonight and look at the eastern gate, you'd notice it's blocked off. It would appear the Muslim world heard the Messiah was supposed to enter through the eastern gate. So they blocked it up with concrete. They said, now he can't go through the gate. And just to be sure, they put a cemetery in the way, saying the Messiah can't go through the cemetery. He'll defile himself. Excuse me, i got a breaking news bulletin tonight. You know, number one, when you can say, let there be, and it happens, I'm afraid the molecular composition of a concrete block won't stop Jesus. <laughs> and I'm breaking news bulletin number two. When one of your many names just so happens to be the resurrection and the Amen. life, some cemetery is never going to stop him either. And the Bible tells us King Jesus will enter through the streets of Jerusalem. Zechariah 14, 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. It's the story of Daniel. It doesn't matter if the Antichrist is on the throne. It doesn't matter if it's a Hitler or a Stalin or a Mao Zedong. It doesn't matter if it's an Alexander the Great, Nero of Rome. It doesn't matter if your name is Nebuchadnezzar or Cyrus. When it is all said and done, every last government, every last kingdom, every last presidency, every last monarchy is nothing but a pile of dust and ashes. King Jesus is sitting upon the throne. The Ancient of Days delivers the kingdom i got to tell you, you read that and say, it just can't get any better than that. Oh, yes, it can. <laughs> Keep going to verse 27. The Bible says, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. My friend, the Bible tells us the Ancient of Days sits down to judge the world. Coming before him now is his son, the son of man, the one who died on a cross for the sins of the world. King Jesus will be delivered the governments of the world, and he will walk through that eastern gate, sit upon the throne, and the Bible tells us that we shall reign with him. Amen. There it is. The Bible tells us those who know him, those who belong to him, hold God's people down to the course of time from Bible times to our time have paid a tremendous price to love and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Why, in the first century, people that were saved, they know the Lord. You read about it in the book of 1 Peter. They literally became fugitives. They had to run for their lives. They lost their jobs for Christ, their friends for Christ. They lost their families for Christ. Ultimately, many of them would lose their lives for Christ. And, of course, that was nothing nothing new. I, in Hebrews 11, the Bible gives us the roll call of the martyrs and the heroes and so many who died for the faith. Why, from the day of the New Testament was given to our present day, down for the course of the the last 2,000 years, there have been plenty of blood shed by righteous people who would not deny their Lord and they would not deny the faith. In the tribulation time, it will only get worse and worse. And for all the blood that has been shed and for all the sorrow and all the tears, for all the death and all the havoc that God's people have paid, there is coming a day when not only will Jesus reign over all the earth, the saved shall reign with him. Amen. What a day is going to be. And that's why when you read the book of Daniel, you just can't, you just got to stop and say there's something bigger here. And, and as great as the story of Daniel's purposes and as mighty as the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and as incredible the story of the three Hebrew boys. And, and we see that amazing story of pride where God patiently, lovingly deals with a king in judgment. When we see Belshazzar and we see the story of Daniel tossed in that den of lions, we can't forget that it's all about Almighty God. For the Bible is not the story of Daniel, it is not the story of Abraham, nor is it the story of Moses, nor Elijah, nor John the Baptist, nor Peter, nor Paul. The Bible is God's story. Amen. And the story of Daniel is that the most of <coughs> God still rules over the affairs of men. God sits on the throne to judge. The kingdoms are given to his son, and we shall reign. 
is so great, there's one more thing you might miss. Look, if you would, to Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 1. And notice when this vision takes place. It was in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Remember where the story takes place? It was the first year of Belshazzar. Well, now, that would be about 30 years after Daniel chapter 4. And, and Daniel, who was a teenager in chapter 1, probably a younger teenager, well, by now he's an 80-year-old man. And, and one thing I love about Daniel, he was a faithful man when he was, say, 14. But he was still a faithful man when he was 80 and 90. The Bible says so. What a story. Amen. And now here's this old man, and, and you know, by the time Belshazzar takes the throne, Daniel's a forgotten man. Oh, under Nebuchadnezzar, my Daniel was promoted and Daniel was honored. Of course, that would happen again, but not in Daniel chapter 5. Now he's a forgotten man. And when Belshazzar throws his party and he pollutes the vessels of God and he mocks and he taunts the living God of heaven, when the handwriting is finally on the wall and nobody can interpret it and nobody knows what it means, well, there was, maybe we call her the queen mother. People at tie all together think she may have been the wife of Nebuchadnezzar. Very old now. She had to tell Belshazzar, you don't even know. You don't even know. But there is one righteous man in this kingdom who can read that handwriting. Well, the next thing you know, they're bringing Daniel in before Belshazzar. Ringing in the ears of Belshazzar are the words of his, probably his mother-in-law, great or grandmother, whoever she was. There's a man in the kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And now when Daniel is ushered in as an 80-year-old man, Belshazzar, that mighty king, says, I've heard of thee, and thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou can read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof. Listen to this joke. Thou shalt be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about thy neck, and be the third ruler in the kingdom. And Belshazzar says, let me tell you what I can do for you. All you got to do is tell me what that writing on the wall says and what it means. He said, first I'll clothe you in scarlet. That would be the, the clothing of the royal crown, uh, uh, of the high society. He said, I'll make you a royal man. Then I'll put a chain of gold around your neck. By law, only people of great rank could wear a chain of gold. And then he said, I'll make you the third ruler. And actually, Belshazzar was a co-ruler at the time in, in the great empire of Babylon. So third ruler was the highest position that he could offer. Here's the king looking at Daniel saying, if you'll read that to me and explain that to me, I'll make you a royal man, I'll make you an honored man, and I will make you a rich man. <coughs> and you know what Daniel said? In verse 17 or, of, of Daniel 5, he said, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. See what Daniel said? He looked up at that king and said, I don't want your royal riches. I don't want your royal clothes. I don't want a chain of gold around my neck, and I don't want anything you can give me. And when you get to Daniel 7, verse number 1, the timing all comes together, doesn't it? Daniel 7, verse 1 happens right before Daniel chapter 5. In other words, Daniel had just had a vision where God showed him that one day the kingdoms of this world, and it doesn't matter if the guy's name is Belshazzar, is going to be in the dustbin of world history. And Daniel's king, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is going to rule and reign over all the world, and Daniel knows he's going to rule with him. And you know, when you know you're on the side of the king, and you know one day we're coming back with him, and you know one day we're going to rule and reign with him, that all of a sudden there's nothing this whole world's got that we really need. Amen. Amen. In other words, Daniel says, I don't need your robe of, uh, of honor, Belshazzar, because one day I'm going to wear a robe that has been worn white by the blood of the Lamb. He says, I don't need a chain of gold around my neck because one day I'm walking down a street of gold. He said, I don't need a promotion that you can give because I know that promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. In other words, Daniel looks up and Belshazzar says, Daniel, do you know who I am? And the 80-year-old man pretty much is laughing and saying, do you know who my father is? I suppose as Daniel walks away thinking, this guy wanted to give me his robe. He wanted to give me his chain of gold. He wanted to make me a somebody. Doesn't he know the God that I serve? He may well, had he lived today, walked away singing a song like this, 
My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands, of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold. His coppers are full, he has riches untold. My father's own son, the savior of men, once wandered on earth as the poorest of them. But now he is reigning forever on high, and he'll give me a home in heaven by and by. So a tent or a cottage, why do I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exile from home, yet still I may sing. All glory to God, I'm a child of the King. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. And you know, when you and I stop and realize that the great message of the book of Daniel is also the great message of the Bible, God is still on the throne. Amen. Amen. And we get so wrapped up in the problems today. We get so wrapped up in the politics of today. We get so wrapped up in the burdens of the day. We get so wrapped up in our issues. We get so wrapped up in the day that we forget to take a step back and take the big picture. Our God is still on the throne. Amen. Many years ago, Abraham Lincoln, sitting in his office, had a, a, a gentleman who has an incredible story. His name was Charles Chinnakee. Charles Chinnakee spent 50 years as a priest in the Roman, Roman religion. And then the Lord saved him. He wrote an incredible book called 50 Years in the Church of Rome. It's an amazing story. And how the Lord kept after him and the Lord kept convicting him. 50 years of conviction before he realized this. Not by works of righteousness I need to save. Amen. Charles Chinnakee was saved. He happened to be good friends with Abraham Lincoln. And, and one day Abraham Lincoln brought him into the office and he invited him to be an ambassador to a country for our, 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 for our nation. And Charles Chinnakee sitting before Abraham Lincoln, the president offered him an ambassadorship. And he said these words to Abraham Lincoln, Though I consider you, sir, the present president of the United States, much above the emperors of France, Russia, and Austria, and much above the greatest kings of the world, he said, I feel that I am now the servant, the ambassador of one who is better even than the great president of the United States, so greater as the heavens are higher than the earth. He turned down the ambassadorship saying to Abraham Lincoln, I appeal to your own Christian and honorable feeling to know that I cannot forsake the one for the other. Abraham was awfully good at listening for a while, and then he shook his head and became very solemn, and he said to Charles Chinnakee, you're right. You are right. There is nothing so great under heaven as being an ambassador for Christ. Daniel says we don't need the world's rewards. And we don't need the world's riches. And we don't need the world's praise. Because when it's all said and done, there won't be a world left. Amen. King Jesus is all that matters. So we can get all wrapped up in getting the gold chains around our neck. And we can spin our wheels and spend our life trying to get those royal robes on our back. And we can do all we can to get the stuff and the things and the games of the world. Or we can open the book and realize he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. One day God the Father sits on the throne to judge. He hands the kingdoms of the world to the Lord Jesus Christ. King Jesus rules over all the earth and we shall reign with him. On that day, all the things that are so important tonight will matter for nothing. Father in heaven, I pray that you would do a work.